You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to The Corbett Report podcast. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan here on the 29th day of October, 2019, and you're tuned into episode 366 of the Corporate Report podcast, Something Big Just Happened. That's right, as you've probably heard by now, on Saturday, the President of the United States took to Twitter to announce that something very big just happened. And so it was that we all waited with bated breath for that press conference on Sunday morning to discover what amazing event had just occurred. Good evening. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of al-Qaeda, and a terrorist who is responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. Oh, uh, uh, sorry about that. that. I think that's the wrong footage. Yeah, um... Uh, Oh, sorry, this is what I meant to play. Last night, the United States brought the world's number one terrorist leader to justice, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is dead. He was the founder and leader of ISIS, the most ruthless and violent terror organization anywhere in the world. The United States has been searching for Baghdadi for many years. Capturing or killing Baghdadi has been the top national security priority of my administration. U.S. Special Operations Forces executed a dangerous and daring nighttime raid in northwestern Syria and accomplished their mission in grand style. The U.S. personnel were incredible. I got to watch much of it. No personnel were lost in the operation, while a large number of Baghdadi's fighters and companions were killed with him. He died after running into a dead-end tunnel, whimpering and crying and screaming all the way. The compound had been cleared by this time, with people either surrendering or being shot and killed. Eleven young children were moved out of the house and are uninjured. The only ones remaining were Baghdadi in the tunnel, and he had dragged three of his young children with him. They were led to certain death. He reached the end of the tunnel as our dogs chased him down. He ignited his vest, killing himself and the three children. His body was mutilated by the blast. The tunnel had caved in on it, in addition. But test results gave certain, immediate, and totally positive identification. It was him. Got him. Yeah. (laughs) You'll forgive my... Uh, confusion a little bit earlier, but yes, this message does seem oddly familiar, doesn't it? That's right, we've just had Obama 2.0 announcing that Osama bin Laden 2.0 was just killed in Daring Special Forces Raid 2.0, right down to the iconic Watching in the Situation Room photograph 2.0, and we all remember 1.0 of that photo with Hillary Clinton with her hand over her mouth watching in, in horror. And uh, trust us, we don't have any body, but we do have some DNA evidence that we took on the spot and immediately tested, and it's him. (laughs) (laughs) 2.0. And just like the 1.0 version of this story, this version 2 is a bunch of absolute baloney that could only be swallowed by the most devoted cult followers of their dear trusted leader who would never lie to them or never tell them anything that was untrue, right? Right? Yes, it is a bunch of baloney, and demonstrably so. I'm not just speaking out of my uh, rear end here. 
So let's get into some of those details. Uh, for one, let's take the Russians, who have just refuted all of Trump's major assertions that he made in that press announcement. The Russian Defense Ministry has no reliable information about U.S. servicemen conducting an operation to yet another elimination of the former Daesh leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in the Turkish-controlled part of the Idlib de-escalation zone. No airstrikes performed by U.S. aircraft or aircraft belonging to the so-called International Coalition were detected on Saturday or during the following days. And since the moment of the final Daesh's defeat at the hands of the Syrian government army supported by Russian aerospace forces in early 2018, yet another death of Abu Bagdar, Bakr al-Baghdadi does not have any strategic importance regarding the situation in Syria or the actions of the remaining terrorists in Idlib. So, despite Trump's claims that, quote, the Russians were very cooperative, they were really good, Russia treated us great, they opened up, we had to fly over certain Russian areas, Russia held areas, Russia was great, the Russians themselves are claiming that he's lying. So, surprise, surprise. And here's another doozy for you from that Trump press conference, where... You will recall in that clip that we watched, he began the press conference by asserting that uh, Baghdadi was the founder and leader of al Siasis. Once again, this is a bald-faced lie. Even if we were to take the mainstream narrative of al Siasis at face value, the group was created long before Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi arrived on the scene by yet another mythical figure, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. And, hmm, why is it that you think Trump would want to memory hole Zarqawi? So again, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi founded this group supposedly in 1999 in Iraq, a Sunni militant from Jordan. And he had a, what can only be described as a remarkable career that uh, brought with it many lives, apparently. So... Again, this all sources from mainstream reporting uh, that uh, and none of this is, you know, just conspiracy reporting. This is all from mainstream news services and ABC and NBC and CBS and Reuters and all of those kinds of uh, outlets. So uh, and they will all be linked up in the show notes. so You can go and read through all of these miraculous dealings of, of Zarqawi and, and uh, his cohorts. But for example, um, back in 2003, it was reported that uh, Zarqawi was killed in a bombing raid in Iraq. But in 2004, it was also reported that he was arrested in Fallujah. So apparently, miraculously resurrected from the dead and then arrested. And then uh, in 2005, without reports in the meantime, indicating how or when or why he was released from or escaped from uh, custody in Fallujah or how he was never arrested to Fallujah in the first place, he was arrested again in Bakuba. And then later in 2005, he was reported as being evacuated from Iraq altogether. By whom and to where, I'm not exactly certain, but at any rate, he was evacuated from Iraq, supposedly. But then in 2005, he was reported as being killed in fighting in Iraq once again. And then in 2006, he was killed in fighting once again, and presumably for the last time this time. So, uh, killed at least three times. Quite an amazing career, one would have to admit. And the, uh, I mean, as crazy as all of these reportings go are, and I think, again, this is just part of uh, the, the, the modus operandi of this current instantiation of the war on the boogeyman, i.e. the war on terror, is that they will throw out a number of names, they will throw out uh, a number of reports saying this person was killed here, this person was killed there. Sometimes those reports are quietly retracted later, sometimes they aren't, sometimes these characters just go on to keep fighting, even after being reported killed, like Zarqawi. But uh, it gets even stranger. Back in 2006, uh, the Washington Post published an article entitled Military Plays Up Role of Zarqawi, in which they reported, quote, the U.S. military is conducting a propaganda campaign to magnify the role of the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, according to internal military documents and officers familiar with the program, end quote. And that same article went on to say, quote, one internal briefing produced by the U.S. military headquarters in Iraq said the, that Kimmet, the one of the generals that oversaw this program, had concluded that 
the Zarqawi PSYOP program is the most successful information campaign to date, end quote. So these, uh, once again, the Washington Post got its hands on internal briefing documents that the Pentagon was using to talk about al-Qaeda in Iraq and their propaganda campaign in Iraq. And th these documents prove that the Pentagon was absolutely 100% self-consciously engaged in a PSYOP operation to make Zarqawi and Al-Qaeda in Iraq seem more important than it was. And they have their own twisted internal logic that was reported on at the time as to why they wanted to do this and why they wanted to build up AQI in the mi minds of the Iraqi people and, and, uh, and, and the people of the United States. And of course, I think, obviously, the, the main part of that was to keep the, United, the American people involved and interested in uh, keeping their troops in harm's way there in Iraq, even long after Bush declared mission accomplished. Well, oh, look, there's Al-Qaeda in Iraq. We have to be there. And there's this character, uh, Zarqawi, that uh, the military was involved in pumping up. So, uh, again, this is just insane. It's insanity. As I hope you're aware, that was a clip from episode 295 of this podcast, Who is Really Behind ISIS, in which I went into great detail about the founding and formation of ICISIS, what it was really about, and who was really behind it. And uh, hint, it's not the mythical figures that they're parading out in front of you like Zarqawi to act as the frontmen for these organizations. Uh, but let's also not forget that between Abu Musab al-Zarqawi and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, there was yet another Baghdadi. This one, Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, who also happened to have mystical, magical powers of resurrection, and oh, by the way, was also believed by the Pentagon to be a fictional character. And it gets even stranger than that when we look at the person who took over from Zarqawi after his final, supposedly reported death in 2006. Someone going by the name of Baghdadi. Uh, one of the many people going by the name of Ab Ab Baghdadi. This one, Abu Omar al-Baghdadi. But again, it's a nom de guerre. It's not his real name. Apparently, his real name is Hamid Dawood Mohammed Khalil al-Zawi. He's also known as Abu Abdullah al-Rashid al-Baghdadi and Abu Hamza al-Baghdadi. So I would not, again, put too much faith, stock, interest, or energy into parsing these various names just to know that this is someone who is referred to as al-Baghdadi and who took over uh, from al-Zarqawi as leader of what was at the time al-Qaeda in Iraq in 2006. Uh, he took over the group and, again, like Zarqawi, had a remarkable career that involved being reported as uh, ki captured in 2007 and then killed in 2007 and then arrested in 2009. And then uh, throughout that period of his arrest, or the period that we were supposed to be led to believe that he was under arrest, he was releasing recordings, um, obviously not from prison, but uh, from wherever he really was, that were being identified and authenticated by the highly, highly suspect Sight Institute, which probably bears a podcast all on its own. But they authenticated these recordings that were being released all of this time that he was reported as being arrested. And then in 2010, he was reported as being killed once again. So, uh, so again, we have uh, multiple reportings of captures and killings and arrests that uh, don't seem to make any logical sense. But just as in the case of Zarqawi, in the case of Baghdadi, it becomes that much more strange when we find out that uh, that uh, the fictional ISI leader, Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, was identified as such by the U.S. Pentagon. Yes, once again, the U.S. military actually reported on how they believed Abu Omar al-Baghdadi didn't even exist. This comes from a Reuters article, well, of one of many sources, but we can source it to a Reuters article, Senior Qaeda Figure in Iraq, a Myth, says U.S. Military, where they talk about a, a senior operative for al-Qaeda in Iraq who was in custody of the U.S. military and was being interrogated, and uh, according to the testimony of this captured uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq fighter, quote, the Islamic State of Iraq is a front organization that masks the foreign influence and leadership within al-Qaeda in Iraq in an attempt to put an Iraqi face on the leadership of al-Qaeda in Iraq. 
U.S. military officials in recent weeks have been pressed to explain the link between al-Qaeda in Iraq and bin Laden's global network, given the military's heightened focus on al-Qaeda in Iraq as the biggest threat to the country. The military blames al-Qaeda in Iraq for most of the major bombings in Iraq, saying the group is trying to spark all-out civil war between majority Shiites and minority Sunni Arabs. All right, again, a very interesting, very bizarre report that again includes briefing slides from the Pentagon that show that the Pentagon itself calls Abu Omar al-Baghdadi the fictional, excuse me, the fictional ISI leader. So once again, the U.S. military didn't even believe this, this person existed. And this was from a 2007 report. So uh, once again, throwing more sand into the water, more mud into the mix to make it even murkier, the U.S. military bumbles in. And it's, again, a question of what their ultimate aim in all of this is, but I think it is answered in that third paragraph where we we learn about how uh, the U.S. military is blaming al-Qaeda in Iraq for the instability in the country at that time, which included, of course, the bombing of the, uh, the, the, uh, the Golden Mosque, which is a false flag operation worthy of an entire subject a podcast in in and of itself clearly related to the P, uh, P2OG operations to stir up Islamic uh, radicalism and terrorism by creating terrorist events and and that's ultimately what was happening that was what was behind this and that's what we can attribute these strange dealings with al-Qaeda in Iraq to the fact that the US military was pumping them up as a PSYOP operation and then apparently revealing that PSYOP operation and saying, look, this guy's a a fake, he's a myth. So it seems that there's a pattern being established here and it's not difficult to see once it's laid out for you like that. Namely, that a shadowy character, potentially an entirely mythical character created out of whole cloth by a Pentagon PSYOP unit, uh, goes on to become the leader of this shadowy terrorist organization, committing heinous act after heinous act, even as he is being reported and re-reported and re-re-reported as arrested and escaped and re-arrested and killed and arrested again and killed again and killed another time and killed once more for good measure until finally receiving his final retirement party. And the only question then is, does Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi fit into this pattern? And the answer, of course, is you bet he does. And we can get a flavor of this, again, just by going through the official timeline of what's been reported about Baghdadi over the years since he gained the spotlight. And a flavor of the confused nature of this reporting, quote-unquote, uh, well, Mockingbird repeating, really, uh, is given even by the, the just the Wikipedia entry on Baghdadi, which notes that al-Baghdi, al-Baghdadi is believed to have been born near Samara, Iraq in 1971. It uh, quotes a semi-authorized biography, whatever that means exactly, to talk about biographical details of his uh, family life. Uh, It notes that al-Baghdadi claimed to have been descended from the Quraysh tribe and therefore from Muhammad himself, but there's no evidence to back up this claim. Uh, Again, a lot of confused and muddied details that may or may not be true and are admitted to not really be hammered down because, once again, this character kind of popped up out of nowhere and appeared on the scene sounds a lot like the other PSYOPs operations that have already been noted as previous leaders of this terrorist organization. But um, that being what it is, we do know that it's following the 2003 invasion and occupation, the illegal invasion and occupation of Iraq, that uh, this Baghdadi character became part of the insurgency. And in 2004, February of 2004, he was arrested by U.S. forces By December of 2004, he was officially released from Camp Buka as a low-level prisoner. That is the official story, although the former commander of that camp has asserted on the record that Baghdadi was there until at least 2009 when the camp was turned over to the Iraqi government. And how does he remember this? Because he specifically remembers Baghdadi telling his captors that he would see them in New York, quote-unquote. So... That's part of this story. The uh, the actual commander of the camp flat out contradicts the official record that says he was released in 2004. That being what it is, by May of 2010, he must have been a free man because we know at that point that's where he took over ICIASIS from the retired fictional character Abu Omar al-Baghdadi. 
In December of 2012, he was reportedly arrested by an Iraqi counterterrorism unit, so we can dust our hands, that problem is solved. Until November of 2014, where apparently he must have been a free man once again because he was reportedly killed in an air raid on a 10-truck convoy outside of Mosul. Then by March of 2015, he had been magically resurrected to have been injured in an airstrike on western Iraq that had apparently left him so seriously injured that he had lost day-to-day -day control of ICIASIS. By October of 2015, he was at least in good enough health to have been escaping in some sort of convoy in Anbar province, where he was once again narrowly escaping death after his convoy was struck. But by June 2016, it was all okay again because he was reported killed once again in a coalition strike on Raqqa. Uh, but then somehow he was resuscitated and reportedly at death's door once again by October 2016 after having been poisoned by an assassin in Iraq. An oddly specific report. Well, he must have recovered from that poison because by May of 2017, the ordeal was over when the Russians claimed it may have killed Baghdadi in an airstrike on Raqqa. Well, whether or not they did, the whole point, the whole, the whole series of events was laid to rest in July of 2017, when the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is the very portentous, incredible, monumental name for Osama Suleiman, aka Rami Abdul Rahman, living in his house in Coventry, who single-handedly reports everything coming out of Syria and is then repeated by the MSM and even establishment lapdog Time dutifully notes that he is considered a more rel reliable source than others because his reports about events in Syria are frequently cited by international news organizations. Talk about a circular argument. Uh, he, they, he swore that Baghdad quote, really is dead this time, end quote, after an undescribed counter in Syria's Dar el-Zur province. But sadly for Suleiman, Baghdadi himself popped up the next month to refute that claim. So there you go. Claim after claim after claim after claim, death, arrest, capture, poisoning, whatever. Continuing to survive to fight another day until it appears they're willing to go out and stick their net out once again and say, no, really, really this time, he's really dead. Um, but but don't don't worry about the fact that this may solve anything or bring the war, the never-ending war of terror to an end, because as an anonymous in, uh, regional intelligence official, is how they're naming him, uh, has assured Newsweek, Baghdadi was, quote, not involved in operations or day-to-day -day of CIASIS, ICIASIS. And anyway, I ICIASIS has already appointed a new leader, Haji Abdullah al-Afari. Well, there's a new name to conjure terror by, so let the games begin again. If all of this has you, well, retching in disgust at the blatant propagandistic nature of these terror boogeymen that are dragged out one after another to scare the population. Look at the scary bearded man. He's going to get you. Oh, we got him. Yay. We're the good guys. We win again. If this is getting you sick and tired of hearing the same old lies, well, we should keep in mind that the most likely explanation for this remarkable career that these terrorist masterminds uh, seem to embark upon namely that we have just witnessed yet another retirement party for yet another faithful intelligence asset or a completely mythical character created by the intelligence agencies, that explanation will be completely ignored by the MSM, just as it was the last time that we were fed this story. Well, according to you and another number of analysts, bin Laden has been dead for quite some time already. If that were true, why would the U.S. wait till now to announce his death? Well, first, let me uh, correct you. I'm not in uh, New York. I'm actually in Japan. Oh, but um, but uh, it's not my contention that, that Osama bin Laden def def definitively has been dead for some time, but that he has been, his death has been announced a number of times at any rate. And, uh, and I don't see why we should take this, uh, this pronouncement any more seriously than any of the previous pronouncements, especially considering the complete and utter lack of evidence that has so far been produced to show that Osama bin Laden or anyone resembling that description was actually killed yesterday. But I think it's important to understand the announcement that occurred yesterday, not through the lens of the announcement 
announcement of the death of some terrorist mastermind so much as the uh, retirement party for a known CIA asset along the lines of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald back in November 1963. And I think uh, Lee Harvey Oswald is probably the best analog for Osama bin Laden as someone who did not have the means, motive or opportunity to do what he allegedly did, not only killing President Kennedy, but also waltzing in and out of the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War after having been working at the uh, top secret Atsugi Air Force Base uh, with no questions asked using money that he didn't have at the time. In the same way, we see Osama bin Laden being the, the rogue element of the bin Laden family of uh, construction fortune, who, of course, has deep ties to the oligarchy of Texas and, of course, the Bush family. So uh, we see uh, Osama bin Laden, of course, having deep ties to the American intelligence establishment. So I see this more as a ploy of uh, the CIA getting rid of one of their old assets, whether he actually did die yesterday or he's been dead for years or whatever the case may be. This is simply uh, discarding a war on terror boogeyman who's no longer scaring the populace. Yes, what else is there to say? Osama bin Laden 2.0, or is it 3.0, or 4.0, or whatever .0, has just had his retirement party, just as Osama bin Laden had his retirement party under the reign of King Obama several years ago. And just like that story was full of holes, full of lies, full of documentable, proven nonsense about throwing a body in the ocean and all of that garbage that we were fed at that time, so too is a new myth being constructed to explain the retirement of one of his successors. And on and on and on it goes forever and forever until the crack of doom, or at least until the public stops buying this crap. And that's ultimately the underlying message for today. This story is a flaming pile of garbage, and anyone who believed that Trump was any different than Obama in perpetuating this nonsense for the, uh, the lowest level of the propaganda pyramid to throw out at the masses, look, we've caught another of these terrorists, we win. Anyone who believed that Trump was any different than Obama should feel bad about that belief. Um, but there is still time to correct your incorrect notions and to rail against the propaganda whoever it is being fed to us by. Because the War of Terror is a complete pop propaganda construct that is only effective if the public believes in it. And just like a magic trick, if you show the audience, oh, look, there's the, there, there's the rabbit up the sleeve, you can see it. If you show the trick, it suddenly has no power. So, Share this information with people in your life who may not know about the remarkable careers of these dastardly boogeymen who, oh, by the way, the Pentagon admits were PSYOP characters uh, invented by the PSYOPs teams in the Pentagon. <laughs> I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. It is here, and all of the links to all of this information will be in the show notes for this episode, so don't take my word for it. Go and look at these documents and these resources and these reports of the same person being killed umpteen times in a row and start to deconstruct this propaganda narrative in front of the eyes of any skeptics in your life. Anyway, that will do it for today. I hope you will support this work if you appreciate it. Your support does keep this uh, report coming to you as little as $1 a month. Details at CorbettReport.com slash members. That's going to do it for this week. I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, thanking you for joining me and looking forward to talking to you again very soon. The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at CorbettReport.com slash support.